three. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Getting Common. I am your host, Carlos Chapman. In my day job, I'm an associate professor at Washington and Lee University School of Law, where I teach all things business. The topic of today's episode is the path, of mar path to marijuana legalization with my guests who are both experts in this area, Rafi Crockett and Kimber Russell. I'll start by having them introduce themselves. First, Rafi. Good morning and happy 420. I am Rafi Aliyah Crockett and today and every day, I guess, I am batting for team Black women do all the things. So in my day job, I work in risk and regulatory compliance. I've been doing that for over 15 years. I am also an alcohol and cannabis regulator for the District of Columbia, where my personal mission is to eliminate disparities in access, ownership, and participation in the city's alcohol and cannabis industries. I work with the Cannabis Regulators of Color Coalition, a coalition of government officials focused on equity-centered regulation, industry best practices, and cannabis competency and standardization. And most importantly, I get my art on a little bit too. I am writer and executive producer of the forthcoming documentary film, Higher Power, about cannabis legalization, racial justice, and statehood in Washington, DC. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us, Rafi. Now, Kimber. Hi, I'm Kimber Russell. I am an attorney in the state of Illinois. I do criminal defense, domestic relations, criminal records relief, clemency, petitions, and I also do cannabis law, which is a new and exciting area of law in the state of Illinois. And there's a lot of unknowns and we're still, we're still learning a lot about it. Um, when I'm not practicing law, my partner and I uh, run a YouTube channel called The Sue Chefs because we're both attorneys and we both love to cook. So oh. check it out on YouTube, Sue Chefs guys. And I'm really excited to be here today. Thank you. And I'm totally looking forward to, we had a pre-show conversation about cooking school and how I didn't need to go, but I am going to watch Kimber's YouTube channel so that I can pick up some of her culinary school tips. Now let's get into the discussion. So Rafi, let's start with your city, Washington, DC. And I'll just ask a simple question. Is marijuana legal in Washington, DC? <laughs> so the simple answer to your simple question is Yes, um, but the actual answer is a little bit more complex. Um, it's legal for adults 21 and over to possess up to two ounces of cannabis. Um, adults can also grow up to six plants in their own home and you can give away for free 99, no exchanges, no gifts for free 99, you can give away up to one ounce to another adult. Um, here in DC, we also have a medical cannabis program uh, that allows registered patients, both in state and out of state, to buy cannabis from licensed dispensaries. So, if DC is federal and not a state, and marijuana is still illegal under federal law, how does this all work? I mean, it's it's really not working. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest with you, it's not working Real at talk. all. <laughs> Real talk, it's not working. Um, so in 1973, DC was granted limited home rule. So, you know, we can elect our mayor, we can elect our city council, but like our laws and our budgets go to Congress for approval. And so most things just kind of, you know, slide by without a hitch, but then other things, including both medical and adult use cannabis cells have not. Um, so while you can use cannabis here in D.C., you can't legally buy it except from a licensed medical dispensary. Um, and that's because of our, our lack of statehood and our um, inclusion as a, as a district, a federal district. Um, so I also want to remind everybody who visits D.C. and a lot of y'all who live here, too, that we have a lot of federal land in D.C. and with that comes a lot of federal law enforcement, like 32 different federal law enforcement agencies operate in our small little district. So as tempting as it might be, um, don't light up in Rock Creek Park, down on the National Mall, kicking it by the reflecting pool, Malcolm X Park, Fort DuPont, none of that stuff, like don't do it. That's a federal case, those are federal charges and you don't want that. So this is very important 
right? This is extremely important. And, and Kimber's our criminal defense person. So she knows how important this is. You can possess it, mm -hmm. but you cannot use it on federal land. Correct. So just, just to make that clear, right? Um, and I know, you know, there are all these dispensaries in DC where you get stickers and t-shirts um, and you, for a cost, and then you get free marijuana. Um, and, you know, uh, Rafi has, we'll get into it more detail, but she has kind of explained that loophole for folks. Um, I know people are still getting arrested and are still like surprised when they get arrested, which is why I just wanted to hammer that point home right? Do, not at the reflection pond. No. No, don't do it. Don't do it. All right. Now, Kimber, you're in Illinois, and I would love for you to give us a comparison of how the rules are working in Illinois and the Chicago area. Well, you know, they're kind of not. <laughs> so <laughs> just like Ralphie was saying, so we've only had legal, we, we've had medical marijuana for some time. And there have been many dispensaries. There's there's dispensaries uh, in Chicago and downstate all over the place. Uh, we've only had recreational marijuana for the last three years. And the problem is that people don't understand exactly what the law provides. Now, Illinois is one of the only states that actually legislated for cannabis legalization. And the, the purpose of that was to look at the other states. What was Washington state doing? What did what did what did Colorado do? Because in Colorado, it was just like everybody and their mama just opened up a dispensary and they just were, it was, it was like the Wild West out there. And that is not what Illinois wanted. So it's been very structured and it's been a very, very slow rollout. And the other big thing was we really wanted to address that equity piece. Now, again, there's a lot of lip service towards equity and towards making sure that people who were going to be running and working these dispensaries and having the benefit of this legalization is going to, is going to be sort of not, I don't want to say reparations, but in a sense to address the fact that the war on drugs has had such a high cost on people of color, especially black and brown people, and especially in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the issue is that with legalization comes an inability to understand the law because the law is about 635 pages. And unfortunately, some of us have had to read it. And right now, the way that it stands, an adult in over the age of 21 can possess up to one ounce of flour, up to five grams of a concentrate. So some kind of like weed oil or CBD oil, CBD oil is, is not illegal here, but some kind of a concentrate. And then you can get a cannabis infused pro product like a salve or an ointment uh, that's no more powerful than 500 milligrams. That is all you can have at one time. Out of state people can come in, they can get one half of that. And for free 95, you can give you can give a gift to another over 21 year old Illinois resident of the, the same amount of those things. Medical, you cannot grow. You cannot smoke it outside. You cannot smoke it anywhere outside of your home. You can't smoke it at the dispensary or down the block. There's no there. There is no legal place in Illinois right now to publicly consume cannabis. Pre pandemic, there was going to be one cannabis cafe that was going to open up somewhere downstate. I believe it was going to be in Springfield that put the kibosh on it immediately. Um, there is no legal place to consume weed outside of your home. And in fact, your landlord can tell you, no, you can't. If you're living in public housing, forget about it. Anything that has federal funding, forget about it. Are you a fireman or somebody who works for the city? Like a, like somebody who's driving some kind of a vehicle, forget about it. Employers can still do drug tests if they want to. Um, there's, there's so many restrictions, but nobody knows about these. I've seen people sit, uh, people can get arrested for smoking weed in their car when it's stationary. You're not allowed to smoke in a boat, in a box, on a fox with, with, uh, with some rocks. You can't do it here, there, or anywhere. If the car is moving or not moving, it doesn't matter. You cannot be smoking it. And the cops are still pilling people over on the pretense of we smelled marijuana, even though they should not be doing that. And there is no roadside test to indicate and these guys are not trained to be some kind of drug influence expert because I can tell you weed hits everybody differently. Most of the time you're not driving, but again, it's illegal to operate any kind of vehicle or even be in a vehicle, even in a boat, even in a recreational boat that you're not driving, you can't use weed. You can't get on a weed bus and have a weed party. Let me just tell you a story about the people that came to the, the Women in Cannabis Conference in 2019, the last conference I attended before the pandemic. 
there were people that literally came in there and said, hey, how about if we give away some free weed along with some t-shirts? Let's have a pop-up dinner where everything is infused with cannabis. Can't do it. You cannot do it. You can't charge people. You can't sell it if you are not a licensed dispensary. You can't purchase it unless you're over 21 from a licensed dispensary. Your street weed guy, that's still illegal. He can still get busted for intent to distribute. And so we, we're seeing a lot of problems with people just like, and believe me, when I went to Seattle, people were smoking in parks. You could not escape the smell of weed. And don't tell me that people aren't smoking weed right on the CTA platform here in Chicago. They totally are, but that's against the law. And even though it's been decriminalized, you can still get cited for that. And that kind of thing is not expungible. So, I mean, we have, we have a lot of remedies available for folks and that's the, 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 criminal, the criminal records uh, piece is that they were supposed to immediately expunge a lot of these simple cases of possession or intent to distribute under 30, 30 grams, which is about one ounce. And again, that was like pre-pandemic, they partnered up with some, some, tech companies out in San Francisco who were supposed to go through all the, the digital copies. And again, in Illinois and Cook County, we're still paper for, for criminal. I know it sounds crazy. We're still running Windows 95 up in here. So you literally have to go get paper documents and file paper documents. So it's been, the, the expungement is on the police side. It's not on the court side. You still have to file these petitions. And with the pandemic, that that put the kibosh on a lot of things. So there's still a lot of people out here who still have criminal records for weed. There's people still chilling in jail for weed. And there's still a lot of people who don't realize they can't walk down the street just smoking it. I'm just so shocked. <laughs> I'm shocked by by what one everything that both of you said, but um, you know, just the disparities, right? Like when I hear people, when you hear people in the community talk about marijuana is legal here, marijuana is legal there. Um, and, you know, Illinois gets on that list and DC gets on that list and all these other states get on that list. And I think the common person thinks everywhere is Seattle or everywhere is Colorado. Um, so just these disparities of where you can and cannot um, is very shocking, especially since people are still getting arrested for it, um, while others are becoming millionaires for it. That's a big deal. I'm glad you brought that up, Carlos, because like part of the problem is that because of how industrial, see, Illinois was so slow on the uptake that by the time we finally did legalize it recreationally, the people who had monopolized it were these big companies like Cresco Labs. And there is complete vertical integration. They own, you have to like, literally everything has to be done in state. We can't, because it's a federal crime. Mm -hmm. um, it's still federally illegal. So if you do something on federal property, that's still a federal crime, regardless of whether or not it's legal in the state. If you step onto federal property, like Rafi said, that's a crime and the feds will get you for that, you know? And you and there is no federal expungement. There is no such thing. State level expungement? Yeah, sure, federal, uh-uh, no. You got that, that's on your FBI record forever. And with respect to um, the way that the medical marijuana licensing worked, it went from being so incredibly difficult to even get a, a license. You literally had to be dying of cancer or have some chronic, chronic disease. It was almost impossible to get it. And the, ba the main reason was so that you would have access to the dispensary. You didn't have to pay taxes on it. That's one, that's one good thing. Like if you've got the, med the medical card, you don't have to pay tax and you can grow up to five plants. Nobody else can grow. Um, all the weed that we consume in Illinois has to be made in state. That means Cresco Labs has a grow operation that they that they license. They have the factory. They have the distillation. They have the they're making the edibles and things like that. Everything has to be done here. You have to get a license to dis, you have to get a license just to transport it. Everybody who works in your dispensary has to has to have a special kind of licensing as well. And now with we're bringing in this new piece where we want to start the recreational dispensaries and people are having to go through this really incredibly labyrinthine licensing. It's all been bound up in litigation because people the people who want to continue the you know the mass marketing the big pharma kind of approach to the weed industry they are they are completely leaving out the people that this was intended to help which is black and brown people who want to own a dispensary in their own neighborhood but the issue is in our city 
you can't even own, you can't even open a dispensary wherever you want to because there are specific zones and then the the alderman basically has to approve that you can open it up there and regardless of whether or not weed is weed is even legal you know theoretically in the state a municipality can decide yeah okay you can get some weed somewhere that is else but we ain't having a dispensary here no way no how it's not happening and there's many there's many localities that have decided that they're not going to do that and they've they've had very negative reaction to it so where it was supposed to be opening up the opportunity for people it's already too late in some cases because all the funds have gone to the people who already have they, they already had the medical the medical dispensaries, those guys just were like, cool, boop, now we're doing recreational too. But they're, but they're owned largely by these huge conglomerates that don't have to worry about that, the, the equity piece. And now people who are trying to get black owned dispensaries open, their licenses are in limbo because all these folks who uh, there were there were something like 185 new licenses that were supposed to be released and a whole bunch like 47 of them I think got through but the rest are tied up in litigation because all these folks are coming in and saying it's unconstitutional to to delineate who can and can't come in and have one of these licenses and that you would have this point system so are you black you get extra points do you live in a location where you've been hit by the drug uh, the drug war worse okay you get extra points do you have people working for you that are from those locations more points so without that equity piece, it's almost impossible to get your license, even in the lottery, to get accepted. So the last two years, we've been bound up in, in litigation, and we haven't really seen new licenses even get released. Well, I, I just, if possible, I just want to go back. You know, you, you started this, this conversation talking about record expungement and resentencing, and I, I really want to actually focus on that um, because that's where we need to start. And we need to start there at the state level and we need to start there at the federal level. Like just deschedule cannabis, just decriminalize the plant and focus on expunging records. The problem is this is America. And so all of our legislation is wrapped up in capitalism. So all of our legislation is focused on licensing that and exporting this and taxing this when we really need to be focused on the people. So cannabis prohibition was race-based, you know, from the very beginning. Its sole intention was to criminalize Black and Latino citizens. Individuals, families, entire communities were targeted for destruction. So it's only right that we intentionally target them for reparations and restoration. Like, you, Kimber, you didn't want to use the word reparations, but I'm using it like very intentionally. That's there what is one place where they're doing that, and Evanston, that's in Evanston, Illinois, and that's in Evanston. But yeah, it's also it. very, it's also very limited, and is what it's also rooted in capitalism because it has to do with uh, your your home ownership. <laughs> right. So the harm <laughs> right. was race based, and so the solution must also be race based. All of this talk about dis uh you know disproportionately advantaged neighborhoods and individuals and blah 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 like no the harm was race-based the solution has to be race-based like you get a gunshot wound to the chest the trauma surgeon is fo isn't focused on your arms and legs his focus is on removing the bullet from your chest so black and brown communities are the gunshot wound and as far as i'm concerned the end of prohibition should be single-mindedly focused on these individuals, families, and communities. And to hell with all this licensing, taxation, and all that nonsense. I couldn't Let's agree get more. to the root of the issue here. I could not I, agree I, more. Yeah, I absolutely agree too. And I, you know, I think the problem with being in a society that is so focused on capitalism is that we think we can just throw money at things and we can throw capitalist solutions at things. But I'm always, like anytime we talk about marijuana legalization, you know, it's like, I know people who are in jail for being weed dealers, like right now, right? And I can walk into a dispensary in DC and buy a t-shirt and walk out with the product that they are in jail for, for selling, mm -hmm. right? And if I cross into Virginia with what I bought in DC, I go to jail, right? Yep. If I walk into, and, and it's, you know, the decriminalization should be where we started. Um, but unfortunately, I think in America, we never start with the right thing. We always want to think 
we'll just make it commercial and then it's fine and, and leave everybody in jail and leave the communities. You know, you can't re put a family together when you've taken a parent out who was selling weed. You can't, you can't redo that with just putting a dispensary around the corner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the problem too, is that here's how bad it got. So right before the pandemic, when there were, cause like every, uh, for the, for the few years that this, this system was in place, there were, there were a couple times a year where you could, you could uh, get an application in. And then there was like a whole lot of, cause like th they decided they didn't want to go the route of like Washington or Seattle. They were trying to be very mindful about the best way to do it. And they wanted to do a slow rollout and start with like a pilot program. And so we started with, we had maybe like seven, dispensaries in Chicago and then maybe it was up to 13 and they wanted to put a limit on that because they did not want to have a, a situation where we went from zero to everybody is is lighting up and running around like it's a Snoop Dogg party and Martha's invited like it's it's that that's what they didn't want to happen so they put these really strict uh, limits on how many people could get a license at a time and the issue is that originally you needed hella because first of all there's no banking there's no federal banking. You can't put your money in a bank. Everything has to be done in cash. That means you need to do a lot of security. We had a bunch of places that were getting that were getting robbed at the beginning of 2020 um, because you just you have to keep the money on site. You can't put it in a bank. You can't keep it anywhere. These people just have these huge vaults with just piles and piles of cash because everything has to be in cash. Banking is the number one thing that has to change before we can federalize anything because we don't have anywhere to put the money. And then the the other issue is that the neighborhoods that they're allowing to have to have access to the dispensaries there it's it's again it's like they want to put a dispensary in a black and brown neighborhood but then they don't want to let the black and brown people run the damn thing it's still Cresco Labs doing everything. They're making the, they're, they're growing it. They're making it, they're distributing it. And yeah, maybe a couple of black people inside are selling it, but they're not getting the benefit on the street level. And, and right now, I, I, I think there's only maybe one application that maybe went through. I can only think of maybe one, uh, one um, there's one place, it, it's not even a cannabis cafe. I think they just became a CBD cafe because that's the only thing that was available to them. And that's run by some black folks. But right now, I don't know of anybody who has actually benefited in the black and brown community because the expungements are getting held up. There's judges who still don't want to vacate because you can still, you if you have more than 500 grams, it's not an automatic expungement. You can ask for the conviction to be vacated, but a lot of judges don't want to agree to do it. Um, even though that is the law and they're supposed to do it, they don't, it's kind of discretionary. They don't want to do it. And, and there was a, there was a, right before the pandemic, there was this, um, there was this town meeting that was supposed to be about, let's all get um, lower income or black and brown people who were interested in learning about um, opening a dispensary to all get together and have a community, some kind of community um, meeting. What ended up happening though, was people who actually were like from Cresco Labs and other of these, I, I, I don't wanna say Cresco, I, I, I'm not sure who exactly it was, but it was, it was one of these big companies. They were going on to everybody's cars and they were plastering literally legal documents saying, hey, you're black, we'll pay you $75,000 to be part of our equity movement. So there was already some jiggery pokery going on here. And the idea is if it's really about benefiting black and brown people, you gotta let them run it. You got to let them be involved. It can't just be white folks up here making a 600 page document. It's actually like 630, a 600 page document about all these things and all the different ways you have to license it. When you're not giving people access to the money, you're not giving access to people with the training and you're not giving access to the community to, to determine whether or not they want it in their community. Is DC any better, Rafi? Um, how, how is the licensing process um, and the dispensary process in DC? So because DC is, you know, we're small and we only have medical cannabis at this point. So we've got um, one, uh, seven uh, dispensaries and uh, eight cultivation centers. We have an open um, application period that's going on right now. It closed on um, March 28th um, to add uh, an eighth dispensary in a ward of the city that currently doesn't have one. And then to add two additional cultivation licenses. Um, it's, it's interesting, uh, when you look kind of on the surface, uh, people are like, oh, you know, DC is not too bad. We've got 
Um, you know, four of our dispensaries are owned by people of color. One of our cultivation centers is owned by a person of color. Um, but when you look beneath the surface, it's like, well, these folks aren't native Washingtonians. One is, uh, the rest are not. Um, they didn't live here in Washington, D.C. when D.C. was the murder capital of the world. They didn't live here in D.C. when we were watching our brothers, sisters, aunts, mothers, everybody getting locked up or being carried away in body bags out of the neighborhoods. And what's so wild is when these dispensaries opened, not a single one opened east of the river in Ward 7 and 8, the communities that have been most disinvested, which have been most devastated by the war on drugs, nobody, nobody wanted to open a dispensary in those neighborhoods, continuing the cycle of disinvestment from those communities. No retail, no grocery stores, no sit down restaurants, um, and nobody wanted to open a dispensary. So we actually had to have emergency legislation passed to specifically open the licensing period again so that somebody could apply for licenses in those communities. That should tell, that, that's a study I'm actually interested in looking at across the country. Like where are these dispensaries being located, particularly the medical ones? I mean, we have communities that are food deserts, we have communities that have poor health outcomes. We have communities with uh, high rates of pollution. And these are the same communities that aren't getting access to medical cannabis. They're not getting access to medical care in any way, shape, or form. So, you know, people look at DC just on the surface and it looks shiny and pretty, um, but underneath it's real ugly. And so, you know, in both jurisdictions, you can give things away, right? Like you can give away a certain amount. How are people opening those businesses in both locations? Is there, are there official licenses for those? You can't open a business in Illinois to do that. You can give it as a gift to your friend, right. but you can't like, so my husband grows medical marijuana. He's been, he's been doing this since 2019. Um, he can't give it, he can, he can give me one ounce as a gift, but he can't give it to anybody else or else he'll lose his card. He can't gift it. He can't share it. He can't give it away because the intent of growing is not to, in, with, there's no intent to distribute. It's supposed to be so that you have a supply of your medicine. So people who have, and the thing is, I don't know if y'all know, but sometimes uh, you can get a lot of weed out of one plant and that's more than one dude can smoke. But Yet here we are, he can't share it with anybody else who might be needing it. He can't even give it away to other people who, um, who have medical conditions where, you know, or they, they, first of all, you got to pay several hundred dollars to get this card. You have to go to a doctor. So if you already don't have a doctor who will, who will prescribe that for you, you're, you've got a problem there. Um, you have to actually have healthcare to get the doctor. You have to get them to tell, to tell, to give you something like a prescription that you need it. And then you have to pay, oh, I was like 400 bucks for a three year license. So he can't share it. Now, I can purchase an ounce of weed at a dispensary and I can purchase another ounce of weed to give to a friend, but they have to be right there. <laughs> you know, I can't, I cannot, you, you can't like, cause literally there were people at this, at this cannabis expo and there was a whole bunch of attorneys there. They were like, so what if we had a bus that went to the dispensary and then everybody got off the bus and then they got back on the bus and then we just had a big party on the bus. No, you can't do it. You can't do it. You can't have a pop-up. You can't have, you cannot, there is no, somebody gets a, cause they literally did that hypo. Like Rafi was saying, oh, what if we give them a t-shirt and some stickers and we give them free weed? No, no, you cannot. You absolutely cannot. This is the problem with the Illinois regime is that there is a complete monopoly on the legal sale of drugs like cannabis to, you have to be a licensed um, dispensary. And to get the medical marijuana, you got to have a license. You can't just roll in with your 
with your regular 21 year old self and get them those special stuff. Like those guys get the special stuff that, that literally is a portion for them because again, everything has to be grown in Illinois. So they have to save some for the medical patients because some people do have chronic illnesses, cancer, all kinds of issues. But the problem is there's this monopoly. It's become completely like Rafi was saying, it's become completely already. It's such a capitalist thing. What about the street level dealers? Why can't, well, let me just tell you how ridiculous the craft growing thing is. To be a craft grower, you have to have a $25,000, a 25,000 uh, square foot facility to be a craft grower. To be a craft grower, you still have to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to get the facility open. And a lot of people won't loan you the money to do it. It's, it's really hard to get a bank to actually give money to fund something that federally is illegal. So that's the problem. Like, where are people getting the funds? Where are people able to open these things? And there's a, com there's a complete lack of ability to actually do anything. If you're, if you're a weed level dealer, a street level weed dealer, you're still screwed. You're still, it's still illegal. What you're doing is still a crime. You can still be incarcerated for years for intent to distribute anything over five, 500, like even over 30 grams, uh, th like an ounce. You can still be incarcerated for that, for selling that. And that's the problem here because it's been so corporatized that it's very difficult to break in at this point because these medical dispensaries basically have the market cornered. There's no room for more folks and they don't have the access even if they did. Wow. Yeah, well, I mean, just to, 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 your, to your point, I, I know you come to DC frequently. And so you see all of the, um, you know, the cannabis shops along H Street, up Connecticut Avenue, up Georgia Avenue, um, they're, they're unlicensed. They're not registered uh, with the city. And so technically what they're doing falls outside of the law. They, you know, they say that they are Initiative 71 compliant, but what Initiative 71 was, the spirit of that initiative was a voter initiative that passed in 2014. 70% of voters, myself included, um, voted to approve this. The spirit was really one of home grow and one of community. And so it we, we do have home grow, not on the medical side, but for, you know, our own personal adult use. And that was the spirit of it, that I can grow cannabis for myself and I can, you know, give some to my friends, uh, give some to my, to my mama, to my aunties, whomever. That was the spirit of Initiative 71. The spirit was not that we're going to set up shops all over the city and uh, engage in, in commerce. That, that's not what that ballot initiative was about. Um, our hope was that following that ballot initiative, we would be able to have full on adult sales and not just uh, medical sales, but you know, because DC is not a state and Congress is free to meddle in our affairs as they wish, you know, that, that got blocked um, by uh, Andy Harris a Republican from Maryland. He doesn't live here. I didn't vote for him. He has no responsibility to the residents of DC. Um, but he came in, placed a rider on DC's budget that effectively blocks us um, from spending our own funds. Now, this isn't federal money. This is DC money. It blocks us from making any, making any law or changing any law that would reduce penalties uh, related to any Schedule One substance. And so unfortunately, that includes cannabis. Um, so that's how the mess that we currently have was created. It was created by congressional meddling. We would have been fine. We passed our initiative. We were all set to hold a hearing to start, you know, having public discussions about what uh, cannabis adult sales would look like in the city. And Congress came and put the kibosh on that. And that was in 2014. And so here we are in 2022, and we're still in that mess. We are still underneath the thumb. Of, of, of Congress. And so we've got these, um, these shops where they're, like you said, giving you a t-shirt, giving you a, a postcard um, in exchange, and you're getting gifted cannabis. But a lot of the shops don't even bother anymore. I mean, I think a friend of mine was like, he asked for his t-shirt and the dude was like, you know, you ain't here for no t-shirt, get on out of here, you know? So they're not even operating under the premise of gifting um, any longer. And uh, how, there's how are been they no able to stay open? Like, that's what I'm going to ask. How are they able to stay open? And like, who's running these businesses? Like, are these people from the community? Are these people from nope. outside? No, nope. they are. They are opportunists who saw a loophole and decided to come exploit it. They are not the, you know, people want to claim that they're black owned. Only a few of them are black owned. 
They are not owned by Washingtonians. The majority of them are owned by people from out of state. They're not the legacy market as people want to, us to believe. They're like, oh, these are legacy folks and you can't shut them down because that's racist and that's per continuing to perpetuate the war on drugs. These are not legacy dealers. These are some, pardon me, they're white folks who've come into Washington, D.C. and seen this opportunity and they've decided to exploit it. The majority of them are not black and the majority of them are not Washingtonian. And that's just the reality of it. And there's no enforcement action because obviously we don't want to criminalize cannabis. We don't want MPD going in and raiding their shops. Like that's not what we want um, on any level. But, so then that leaves some sort of civil enforcement. And of course, everybody has finger pointing. Well, it's Department of Health. Well, it's Consumer and Regulatory Affairs. Well, it's ABRA, you know, and nobody wants to be uh, the one responsible for shutting down the, uh, the Initiative 71 shops. And so our legislators have tried on numerous occasions, including just last week, to um, implement some sort of enforcement action, civil enforcement, not criminal, civil enforcement whereby they would face like a $30,000 fine and the landlord who's leasing the premises to them would also face up to a $30,000 fine. And even that was balked at um, by legislators because nobody really, you know, it's an election year and nobody wants to uh, have their hands in, in shutting down cannabis. Wow. Now, Rafi, you've mentioned statehood um, quite a bit, and I know that you have your film. Um, so I'd love for you to talk about how DC statehood comes into play and what the premise of your film, Higher Power, is. Sure. So Higher Power uh, uses cannabis legalization to really explore and to educate viewers about DC's lack of self-determination. Um, I think I mentioned earlier, we were granted limited home rule in 1973. We can have our own mayor. We can have our own uh, city council. Uh, we are actually allowed to vote for president now. Um, we've started electing our own attorney general in the last like 10 years. Um, but we don't have two senators. We don't have a voting delegate in Congress. And it leaves uh, Congress really free to meddle in our affairs as they wish. And unfortunately, they've done so in ways throughout the years, through decades now, that consistently impact like the social and the economic and physical health of DC residents. For many, many years, they blocked us from having a clean needle exchange program. We all know, we've all seen the scientific evidence that clean needle exchanges prevent the spread of HIV and other bloodborne diseases. It has been proven all over the country, all over the world. Congress prevented DC from implementing a, a needle exchange program and DC's HIV rates skyrocketed, skyrocketed. It was intentional genocide against the black people in this city. There's no other explanation for it. We wanted medical cannabis as early as 1998. Our legislators had passed uh, laws so that we could have medical cannabis here in DC. Congress blocked that for 10 years. They didn't allow us to have a medical cannabis regime in the city. And so since 2014, they have been blocking us from having an adult sales regime in this city. And these are just the latest uh, evidence of congressional meddling. Um, you know, Eleanor Holmes Norton, God bless her. She is our non-voting delegate um, in Congress. Uh, I think uh, Kimber, you mentioned earlier, you know, that you can't uh, use cannabis in public housing or in any kind of housing that is federally subsidized. And that's a huge, um, it's a huge problem for so many black and brown people and poor people in general, not being able to use their own medicine in their own homes. So Congresswoman uh, Norton has introduced legislation to in the house to try to remove that prohibition so that people do have a safe place to use their medicine in the safety of their own home. And that's been repeatedly you know, blocked. They won't even you know, bring that up for a vote. Um, so that, those are the things that we deal with here in, in Washington, DC, lacking any kind of self-rule and self-determination. Um, and it only gets worse um, when we are under uh, Republican administrations. Um, I think 
we've got folks as recently as a few months ago who threatened that if the Republicans take back the House and the Senate, they are going to roll back what little home rule we have here in Washington, D.C. I don't know exactly, you know, what they mean by that. You know, are they going to not allow us to have a D.C. council anymore? Are they not going to allow us to have a mayor any longer? I don't know. But they have publicly threatened to do this to us. And uh, that's really what my film Higher Power explores. And it's told through the lens of cannabis legalization because that's really something that everybody in this country can really understand and get behind, you know, like, two thirds or, so, or more of voters actually support cannabis legalization at some point. So I think this is the perfect medium to uh, get that message out about DC's need for statehood. You know, what I find fascinating about DC in particular in your film, um, and I have a book that I'm working on that's gonna kind of wed the, the alcohol licensing and prohibition to, to marijuana to explore barriers to entry. Um, but these things that we criminalize and these things that we call vices um, and, and who we choose to punish with them highlights so many of our racial disparities and our other beliefs, you know, in this country. You know, the fact that you essentially need to be a wealthy, sick person to get a medical license. And you also need to be a wealthy, sick person who has no government support for your housing to even use the medication that you could barely afford. Right. Like that is such a uniquely American problem. Um, it is such a uniquely kind of, you know, the marriage of our racism and our capitalism um, and just on display with what is happening uh, with the cannabis industry and with legalization across the country. Um, you know, it was it was pointed to me as marijuana became legal, which states went first. Right. You know, it's states that do not have large populations of people of color that went first. Right. And, and the South and other states that are historically black and brown are probably going to be the last to go unless we get federal. Now, Kimber, I have a question for you. You know, in places where this is legal, um, you know, and more legal than Chicago and, and D.C. or Illinois and D.C., which is why I had you two together, because I was like, those are the states where I have or places where I have have friends who truly, truly think it's just like Washington state. Um, and I think it's impo important to highlight that. But my question is how do consumers know what they're getting? Right? That's you a know? great question. Yeah. Um, you don't, you really don't because there's, there's sort of there, you can, the, the crazy thing is if I go to the store to buy a deodorant, I know there's secret, there's smells like teen spirit. I know the differences. I know what they can take. There's dove. If I go to a dispensary, they're like, well, we got Maui Wowie, we got Banana Brains, we got Calypto Music, like they all, they'll be like 50 billion different kinds of, well, here, this will, this will, this will give you, this will give you an idea, Carlos. So my husband decided that he wanted to be part of the Cannabis Cup this year. And so High Times Magazine sponsored uh, a part, like, so you had to pay, you had to pay several hundred dollars to be a judge for the Cannabis Cup. And then everybody had to go and pick up the amount of weed that they were allowed to get. And they, uh, he decided to do the edibles. Um, cohort. So so the individual readers of High Times magazine were each able to vote on you could vote on bud, you could vote on edibles, you could vote on salves and ointments or whatever each category. And so he brings home five different types and they all had different kinds of packaging. Now the the problem is each state has to have different has different requirements about how to package it and what information goes on there. But really all it needs to contain is how many milligrams of THC or CBD does it have and maybe what strain. If you're lucky, it'll tell you sativa versus indica. Sometimes it'll say hybrid. Sometimes it won't say anything. It'll just say each each one is is five milligrams. But I'll tell you what, this this attorney right here made a mistake because the packaging was so hard to read that I thought each each individual candy was seven milligrams. Oh no, it was 25 milligrams a piece. And I ate the whole thing. And 
if I tell you I was crawling across the kitchen floor to get to the bathroom because I couldn't stand up. And I was high until the next morning. And that's the problem right there. Like we don't have a, you don't know where this stuff is coming from. My husband has actually mentioned that he's had some friends who've gone to dispensaries and have actually purchased moldy weed because there's no regulation. I mean, yeah, there's regulations, but who's out here being the weed inspector? We can't even get people in Chicago to come and inspect the buildings, let alone the weed. There's nobody coming around here saying, hmm, yes, well, the, the moisture in this weed is too high and it needs to be blah, blah, blah. Like we don't, half the time you're lucky if you can even get the name of the strain and whether it's indica or sativa. You, there's no re real regulation of you can only grow these types of strains or you can only grow this, this and this type of you know, or you don't know if it's organic. You don't know if they've used pesticides. You don't know who's growing it, how it's, how it's being done. It just shows up and everything is so from state to state, it's different. Like in, in, in Colorado, they actually have to put certain imprints on the candies and they have, or, or on the, the edibles and things. And they have to, they have to get, you know, the, a scientist, they have to go to a lab and they have to do the, they have to figure out how much is in there and everything. And, but, but the packaging is not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily comport with, you know, the information that I need. Mm -hmm. I need to know how long is this going to take to hit? Do I need to eat some food before or after? Um, what, what's going to happen to me when I take it? No, it'll just literally tell me this is the flavor. It's tutti frutti. It's five milligrams. Good luck. You know, so uh, the thing about going to a dispensary is that you do have the bud tenders who are supposed to be there like, oh, yeah, well, for this condition, you might want this strain. And for this condition, you might want this strain. But there's no government regulation of bud tenders. Anybody can roll up in here and be like, yeah, I know I'm Cheech and Chong. I know everything about everything. But they could just be on some bullshit, you know, and they could just be saying whatever they want to say. And the white folks are rolling in like, oh, yes, yes, the Maui Wowie. Mm, yes, yes, that's good for that's good for anxiety and that's good for depression or whatever. And these people are actually diagnosing you. And that's a problem that I have. Have because now that the white folks and I'm one of them, we're over here being litigious and being the ones who are like, we got to have rules. Let's have a rule book. Let's have inspectors. We're, we're also the ones who immediately think that we're experts in everything. And, and people are being diagnosed for anything that you can imagine. They're like, oh yeah, there's some weed for that. And to some extent, well, yeah, I might agree, but on another, on another, <laughs> In another way, there's absolutely no regulation of how people are getting it, what they're getting. The doctor, I don't know what the doctors are prescribing. If the doctors say, yeah, get some medical marijuana, they're not necessarily telling you what strain you should be using or what strength you should be getting. Should you use a tincture? Should you use a lotion? Should you use an ointment? Should you use a this? Should you use a that? Like we are still in the wild west, you guys. It is, it is the amount of times that I have seen somebody have a very bad time coming out of a dispensary. It's amazing because the stuff that you get is so much more potent than the stuff that, that you used to get on the street. This stuff, they, they are very serious about making sure that you get the maximum potency. And one way that they can do it, like especially with the edibles, which I also make myself, is they can start putting like soy lecithin into them. If you put soy lecithin into something, it's gonna make the uptake a lot faster. And there's certain, like, if you, if you, if you take it with a little caffeine, the uptake is faster. If you take it with some alcohol, the uptake is faster. And that's the problem. Now, now we're, now we're having counterindicated things. The other issue that we have is there are certain conditions and certain medications that you're on that can be counterindicated for weed use that can cause you to have a psychotic break or other serious issues, suicidal ideation, other things like that. And uh, dispensaries are not equipped to handle and they're certainly not asking somebody who rolls in, are you taking Adderall right now? Maybe don't have weed. You know, they're not doing that. And so we're seeing some bad results and there isn't any real regulatory framework for that. And there certainly isn't a framework right now for consumers to know if I, if I use this, how is this going to, how is this going to be indicated with, with the current medications that I'm on? And a lot of people are afraid to tell their doctors they're even using cannabis because of the judgment that they might get, especially if you're a black or brown person. And we know about racism in the medical profession and we know about misogyny in the medical profession. If you're a black woman, forget about it. If you come in and roll in and say you're using weed, they're gonna, they're gonna attribute all of your issues to that as opposed to whatever you might be presenting for. So that's the problem. A lot of people have actual medical conditions. They're medicated. They're not telling their doctors they're using cannabis and they're having counterindications because of that. And there's no 
there's absolutely no way to control for that right now. So it feels like we're in the worst of all worlds <laughs> right now, right? We, we've we got sorta ish legalization. Um, we've got no real way to quality check. We've got continuing capital access issues that we've always had. Um, and so for my closing question to you, Rafi, what do you think the future holds for marijuana legalization? And, you know, what do you think it takes to fix all this? Oh my gosh. I know that's a hard one. I mean, so I believe folks when they show you who, you who they are the first time. Um, so, I mean, honestly, I have no reason to believe that black and brown people, people who've historically cultivated and processed this plant, both as industrial hemp and as consumable cannabis, I really have no reason to believe that our communities are gonna benefit from legalization in any way. Um, you know, states and, and different municipalities are implementing social equity provisions, um, but as soon as federal legalization comes, they're gonna be washed away along with uh, interstate commerce unless um, there are some really, really strict intentional policies put in place to preserve, not just preserve them, because most of the social equity programs um, as they are now need to be retooled, um, but we need to preserve them and we need to build upon them. And so my concern honestly is that federal legalization is not going to be good for black and brown people. It's not going to be good for people who were operating in uh, the legacy market. Um, Shalene Title, she is the co-founder of the Cannabis Regulators of Color Coalition. And I mean, she argues um, in a recent article, I can't remember the name of it right now, but you know, she really argues that, you know, this ever increasing market consolidation, which Kimber talked about, um, by like large corporations, and then these continued high barriers to entry for small businesses, um, it's just going to lead to a market that's controlled by a handful of companies. And we see this regularly already. Uh, Kimber, you know, has put Cresco on blast a couple times. So I, I guess we'll just continue to beat down Cresco. But, you know, just last month, they announced that they were purchasing Columbia Care. Now, Cresco already owned like 20 brands themselves. And then Columbia Care owned like more than a dozen. So with that purchase, this one company now has, you know, well over 30 brands under, under their umbrella. And they are in fact, you know, vertically integrated. In fact, uh, here in DC, Columbia Care is a vertically integrated business. They own both a cultivation center and a dispensary. Um, so unless we have really intentional policies, uh, the cannabis industry is going to look just like big pharma. <clears throat> it's going to look like big tobacco. It's going to look like, you know, big alcohol. There's a whole lot of alcohol brands out there, but they're all owned by like Anheuser-Busch and S.A.B. Miller. Um, so we have to prevent monopolies because we have to prohibit uh, vertical integration. And... Um, we have to limit the market share that any one company can have. I mean, you can't, we can't have a successful, just equitable industry if one company, two companies, three companies um, are owning everything state to state. Well, wow, we're out of time. I need to thank both <laughs> of my sorry. guests. <laughs> it's okay. I want to thank Rafi and Kimber for joining us. Um, if you ever miss an episode, you can catch the rebroadcast anywhere podcasts are played. I am Carla C on social media if you need to find me. Um, thank you both so much, truly, truly. Um, and thank you all for listening. <laughs>